Okay, um, so I'm going to tell a joke this morning, and then I'll share a spiritual thought. And then could I please get um, a volunteer for the opening prayer today? Cameron, could I have you say it for us? Yeah, I was just about to volunteer, actually. <laughs> I can see it in your face. All right. All right, let me pull up my joke. <clears throat> Walter took his wife, Ethel, to the state fair every year. And every time he would say to her, Ethel, you know that I'd love to go for a ride in that helicopter. But Ethel would always reply, I know that, Walter, but that helicopter ride is $50, and $50 is $50. Finally, after many years, they went to the fair again, and Walter said again to Ethel, Ethel, you know, I'm 87 years old. If I don't ride that helicopter this year, I may never get another chance. Once again, Ethel replied, Walter, you know that helicopter is $50, and $50 is $50. This time, the helicopter pilot overheard the couple's conversation and said, listen, folks, I'll make a deal with you. I'll take both of you for a ride. If you can both stay quiet for the entire ride and not say a word, I won't charge you. But if you say just one word, it's $50. Walter and Ethel agreed, and up they went in the helicopter. The pilot performed all kinds of fancy moves and tricks, but not a word was said by either Walter or Ethel. The pilot did his death-defying tricks over and over again, but still, there wasn't so much as one word said. When they finally landed, the pilot turned to Walter and said, wow, I've got to hand it to you. I did everything I could to get you to scream or shout out, but you didn't. I'm really impressed. Walter then replied, well, to be honest, I almost said something when Ethel flew out, but you know, $50 is $50. All right, uh, for our spiritual thought today, um, I had a really interesting conversation with my daughter this morning. So my daughter's six years old. She turned six last month. And um, she started kindergarten this year, okay? And a couple of times in the last few weeks, uh, she, she's mentioned how she wasn't super excited to go to school. You know, the first like couple of months, I feel like she was super excited to go to school. Uh, but then like as November ended and December started up and especially now in January, she's, there have been many occasions where she's like, I don't wanna go to school today. I'm like, yeah, well, uh, you have to. Um, so anyways, th th this morning we're talking and she's like, daddy, am I going to have to go, go to school for the rest of my life? <laughs> and I kind of chuckled. I'm like, well, it's going to feel like that for a while. Uh, and then I told her, you know, 12 grades and then college and then perhaps more college and perhaps more after that, um, depending on what she wants to do. And, uh, she seemed really disappointed by my answer. And I felt kind of bad as her dad, you know, to, to break that to her, um, but anyways, it reminded me of a scripture, okay? So uh, this scripture is in Mosiah chapter 24. The, the headline of this chapter says, Amulon persecutes Alma and his people. They are to be put to death if they pray, okay? So all of these people are in bondage. And it's so brutal that if they even pray, then they'll be put to death, all right? Um, and it came to pass that so great were their afflictions that they began to cry mightily to God. That's in verse 10. Verse 12 says, And Alma and his people did not raise their voices to the Lord their God, but did pour out their hearts to him, and he did know the thoughts of their hearts. And it came to pass that the voice of the Lord came to them in their affliction, saying, Lift up your heads and be of good comfort, for I know of the covenant which you have made unto me, and I will covenant with my people and deliver them out of bondage. And I will also ease the burdens which are put upon your shoulders, that even you cannot feel them upon your backs, even while you are in bondage. And this will I do that you may stand as witnesses for me hereafter and that you may know of a surety that I, the Lord God, do visit my people in their afflictions. And now it came to pass that the burdens which were laid upon Alma and his brethren were made light. Yea, the Lord did strengthen them that they could bear up their burdens with ease and they did submit cheerfully and with patience to all the will of the Lord. It reminded me of the scripture because I think of these people, you know, they're in bondage. It's pretty rough. And it's like, man, that's ridiculous. And then they started praying to the Lord. All right. And immediately when they started play, praying, the Lord answered their prayers in more ways than one. Um, not only did he give them that comfort initially when they first prayed, but then he also caused that their burdens should be made light, light enough that they could even experience joy um, in this time of bondage when otherwise it would seem impossible to be able to submit cheerfully and with patience to the will of the Lord. The reason why this reminded me when talking to my daughter about school um, was because of these afflictions that they that they faced. The Lord often allows us to feel pain and to experience affliction 
uh, to help us in many different aspects of our lives. Uh, but one of which is to help us draw nearer to him, to help us grow in faith, uh, to help us choose to come unto him. Every time we do that, every time we choose to exercise our faith, whether it's through affliction or not, um, we're blessed and our faith is increased and we're strengthened and we grow closer to our heavenly father. And, you know, so I thought about my daughter, Hannah, having to go to school for the next who knows how long. And um, that might feel like an affliction at times. You know, you might be in school right now. Maybe you're homesick. Maybe you took on too big of a load and, and you feel like you have to because you have to provide for a family. Maybe you're just stressed. Maybe you're lonely. Maybe you wish you were at a different school. It could be a million different things. But one thing is common amongst all of us that we all have afflictions in this life and they're by divine design. And so I would just encourage you guys that when you feel like that, you know, when you feel like whatever you're facing in your life is a burden um, that you can look at the example of Alma and his people um, and raise your voices to God and pour your hearts out to him. Um, he is anxious to bless us. I know that he loves us. I know that he wants to bless us. And so often in my life, I feel like he's just sitting up there waiting for me to, to do something so that he can bless me. And as soon as I do, he's always right there. So that's my thought for today. Uh, let's see, Cameron. Could you say our prayer for us? Our kind Father in heaven, I'm grateful to be here as a class this morning to be able to uh, learn uh, more about programming. We ask that please bless our professor that he'll be able to uh, relay the information that he needs to, that we'll be able to understand, and that this week can be a good week. And we love that you can say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Cameron. All right, relaying the info that I need to, I, I appreciate that prayer. Um, I'll also hope that you guys ask questions, if you have questions. That'll help me be able to relay any information that you need um, because if you have questions, we can get them answered. All right, let me pull up our slides here. Lesson two. So this week, uh, we are kind of focusing on reviewing Python, all right? Now, many of you just took CSC 110 last semester so hopefully these concepts uh, are super familiar are super familiar to you, uh, and maybe you don't even re need a review, and that's totally cool. But for anyone who's like, yeah, I don't really remember last semester very well, or I took this a couple of semesters ago, or I never did very well with Python in the past, um, hopefully this will be beneficial to you. Before we dive in to the week two readings, uh, where most of my slides are derived from, uh, do you guys have any questions? Uh, I answered one question right before class started from the assignment, uh, but do you guys have any other questions as you were working through code last week or looking at stuff this week? Any questions at all? Beth, go ahead. So as I was looking at the code, oh. when we're doing the, um, let's see. When it talks about doing like the names of the name when you're doing a um, where did I put that? So it says, okay, you have your list or your set, and you're doing for family and names. Say you're gonna you're gonna um, do a while loop, right? Okay. Can the, when you do families, can that be anything? Can you like do for I in names and then print I? Yeah, does, it, does anyone have an answer for that? Does anybody know? Can I say that again? Okay, so you're doing a while loop and you have a list or a set and you say for, like this one says for color and colors. I'm wondering if you can put for I in colors and then say print I instead of using the word color. And can you just make it anything you want? That's like making a variable right there, correct? Yep, it is a variable that you're putting in place there. Okay. Because of that, you have pretty free reign over it. You can name it anything you want as long as it's not a re reserved keyword in Python. Okay. So great question, Beth. Okay, any other questions? Uh, I have a question real quick. Yeah. Um, so I don't remember what assignment it was this week, but it was the one 
we have to do like number of total manufactured items and then like how many are in each box, I think. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I never use the like try accept. And so I was trying really hard to get that to work. Yeah. And I could never get it to print out um, the name of my variable if it wasn't what it was supposed to be. Is there a way to do that with try and accept instead of using like nested ifs statements? Do you want to share your screen real quick, Blake? Yeah. Because the answer is pretty much uh, yes, always yes in programming. Okay. Pretty much everything is possible. Uh, but, but let's go ahead and have a look. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, I can see. Okay, cool. So yeah, I tried to, I don't know if you can see on the bottom, but it just leaves it blank. And I think I get it to work where like, it won't do anything that it's not supposed to do unless it's a whole integer, but I can't get it to print. Interesting. <clears throat> Okay, so this is a little bit of a tricky answer. Um, in line six, what are you doing? Um, I'm just setting it blank, so it's outside the while loop. It is blank, and that's true, and it does have to be there, uh, but what are you setting it to? Oh, a, a string. It's a string. So what that means is on line 10, when you say in input number of total manufactured items equals number of items, because number of items is in is inside of a while block and a true a try block, both of those will introduce their own scope. Okay, so if you didn't do anything on line six, um, if you tried to use number of items anywhere else in the code, you know, starting on line fifteen, it wouldn't work because number of items would not be declared in that scope. So on line six. You have to declare it there if you want to use it in other places in the code. But what's happening on line 10 is it's saying, oh, okay, I have an integer that I'm going to assign to number of items. And because the data type is different, line six is a string, line 10 is an int. Because the data type is different and it's in a different scope, it will create a new variable, okay? And then in line 14, it's confused and it's like, hey, I, I don't see anything here because I'm assuming it's still grabbing that value from line six, okay. that empty string. And so I would assume that on line six, if you just said number of items equals zero, then that should work for you because then it will identify those as the same variable and then you'll be able to use it. Let's see if it works. Oh, no. Okay. <clears throat> it works for, it looks like it works for, oh, no, no, yeah. Negative numbers. So it looks like the first one didn't work because you typed in a string that was unable to cast it into an int. Uh -huh. So it never assigned the variable. <clears throat> so the try except did what it was supposed to because it didn't throw an error in Python, uh, like you could continue to run your program, but mm -hmm. that value is never assigned to number of items because the, the casting it to an integer failed. Okay. <clears throat> so for this assignment, it's probably still easiest to do just like while loop and then nested if statements. Probably, okay. yeah. But great question. And hopefully my explanation helped a bit. Yeah, no, that was super helpful. Okay. Awesome. Oh, okay. Okay. So, Birch, I I'm wondering. I don't. I I think I haven't learned anything about uh, try and accept. What? Yeah. Blake, where, where'd you get all that stuff? Um, I was just looking it up over Stack Overflow, and I wanted to try it. Okay. Do Do you want to explain a bit of what try accept does? Um. So I'll probably get this wrong, but to my understanding. It's going to try, well, in this instance, it's going to, um, whatever, yeah, actually, I, yeah. Um, so if you name a variable and you want to test it for something, so in this instance, I'm testing to see the input is an integer, and then you take it to assert, which is kind of like the parameters, I'm guessing, 
Um, and so for me, it has to be larger than zero. And if that's true, <clears throat> then it will break, which means it will jump out of it. And if it's not true, then it will go for the accept of whatever I wanted to output if the try parameters aren't men. I don't think that's super clear and I don't know if I got that correct, but. So I, I think that was pretty good. Uh, basically it's a way to handle errors, okay? Uh, you can do it, you can do it other ways as well. Uh, it looks like Blake's trying to get it as a functional part of his program, which as you can see, um, could have some benefits, but it, it looks like it also, it, it, can't, it can't do everything. Uh, but let me make a new file right here and I'll show you uh, the basis of why people would use try and accept. So I'm just going to call this temp.py. Oh, it already exists. Temp2.py. Okay. Um, so in here, I'm just going to say, I'm going to do exactly what he did. I'll say number of uh, something equals, and then I'll say int, and then I'll say this is not an int. Okay. So what he just did, um, he tried to cast a string that he typed in, like CSGE something. Uh, into an int. Now, this function is going to convert whatever is inside of this to a whole number, right? So if I typed in as a string like 50, that would work just fine because yes, it's a string, but it'll recognize that it can convert to an integer, right? But if I do this, um, I would have, me personally, I'd have a hard time converting that to a number. Okay, someone told me to convert that to a number, I'd, I'd have to figure something out. Uh, but watch what happens when I run this. So I'm going to open this up in my terminal. And I'm going to say pi temp2.py and run it. Now watch what happens. Uh, this is an error. Okay, so it broke my program. If I had something else right here, like print hello world, watch what happens. Up arrow, enter. Notice it did not print hello world because my entire program stopped, it died. When it hit that error, it's like, I can't convert that string into an int, it just stopped. Well, when Blake did that inside of the try block, it didn't stop, okay? Uh, it didn't assign the variable, okay? It still couldn't convert it to an int, but because it was in that try block, um, it went to the accept and then the code could keep on running. And so very frequently, in the professional world and in programs that you'll write in this class, we will use try accept blocks for error testing, all right? So anytime a user types in something and you're expecting a number back or a string back or something, um, you could use a try accept to make sure that they typed in valid data. Um, otherwise, if they didn't, you know, if I just had like an input right here and they typed in a word, then my program would fail just like this and I wouldn't be able to do anything else with my program. But if I put it in a try accept block, then I could handle that error and then say, hey, you typed in a word or you typed in invalid data, uh, type in a number, please, or something to handle that so that my program can keep running. Could you explain a try block? Yeah, so a try block uh, is like what Blake showed us. Let me actually pull up W3Schools here. Um, let's see, Python, try accept. Thank you, W3Schools. All right, so right here is about as simple as it gets, okay? Uh, but I could say, I'm gonna try and then I'll print this. Now, if this failed for whatever reason, let's say X wasn't defined, um, then this would fail. This try would fail, be like, you know, I, I can't print that. If I tried printing a variable that didn't exist in my file right now, it would throw an error uh, very similar to this. So let me comment that out and I'll come over here and I'll say, uh, print X and I'll hit save, come back over here and, and look at that. It says X is not defined. Again, it broke my program right here. I could say print, uh, oops, some string. Okay. And if I try to run that, that string will never get run or that second print will never get run because my program broke because X is not defined. Okay. Now let's throw this in a try block, uh, which that's all it takes. The keyword try with a colon. And now um, I will be able to run this and watch what happens now. Okay. Oh, we still got that same error. Okay. Uh, so let's come back over here. Let's throw in an accept to complete this. And I'll say um, X isn't defined. We need new data. All right. 
And then down below, I'm going to put one more print statement just to test this out and say this works. I'm going to save it, come back over here and hit up arrow. Okay, and notice I don't get a big old ugly error. Instead, X isn't defined, we need new data, and my program continued to run. Okay, so the try accept, it's pretty simple, you know, it's just two words. Okay, try colon, and then whatever is intended over underneath try will be stuff that we are going to try tentatively, hoping that it works. But if it doesn't, we have our accept to handle that, and then we can keep going with our code. But that's all there is to it. Beth, did that did that help? So does it mean that it ignores the uh, arrows or? Yes, that's exactly okay. what it is. Yeah, it's like, hey, this might produce an error. Let's try it. And if it throws an error, then I'm going to run this code right here, my accept block. Okay, if it doesn't throw an error, watch this. Uh, no error here. If it doesn't throw an error, then notice it didn't say X isn't defined. This is kind of like an if else statement. Okay, it's like, hey, if this throws an error, run the accept block. If it doesn't throw an error, we'll run the try block and skip the accept block. It'll never run both. It'll just be run one or the other. Um, but but that's how this works. We try something. If it throws an error, then we run this code. And if it doesn't, then we successfully run this code. And then we jump outside of our try accept block of code. Okay, that was a fun tangent. Any any other questions on this, or any other questions of anything about anything? I was just wondering if that same error that Blake had would happen like an if statement instead of a try statement or any other types of. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I, I would encourage him to, to test that out, uh, but it's very possible. And here's why, because anytime you see this colon and something needs to be indented here, uh, we're going to have different scopes being introduced. All right, so for example, if I say uh, X equals 20, and I come down here and I'm gonna put another print down here. It says print X, all right? Now, this is the same variable, or at least it looks like the same variable, but this is declared in a different scope than this print statement, okay? So, so watch what happens when I run this, okay? Oh, that did work. Oh, look at that, okay? Um, but anyways, I'd encourage him to test that out because when you declare things in different scopes and reuse it, especially with different data types, it can have, unseen ramifications and oh, so okay. whether it's a try accept block or an if else or a while loop or or anything you know anytime you have that colon it'll introduce it a, a potentially introduce a new scope so thanks okay sweet guys any other questions um i've got one quick question yeah go ahead Aiden. so in the uh proving where uh do you mind if i share my screen no 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 go ahead Are you talking? I can't hear you. I'm seeing awesome code. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> You're good. I, I took this from the, I was muted. Uh, I took this from the preparing and then I was just trying to test it out, see how it works. Yeah. And so I was wondering with the dot items, is that only, I'm well, not the dot items I'm saying for um, this right here, the comma for instantiating the two. Does that work only when a um, variable or something has two of its, two of two items in a set? But together? Yes. Yeah. And, and potentially, generally, that's only used with dictionaries. But you can use the same type of syntax with, with just standard objects um, that could potentially have uh, many more uh, keys and values. Um, but, but yeah, generally, the, generally, it's used with dictionaries where there's just key value pairs. If you wanted to just print one of the items in the dictionary, can you just put that name instead of both? Um, so you can with the first one. Uh, if you wanted to print the second one and only the second one, what I would do is I would still say on line 23 for I number and name, but then on line 24, just print name. So if, if I wanted access to both sets of that data going through that loop, on line 23, I'd have to have a comma there. I'd have to I'd have to declare both as variables. And then on line 24, I could just pick which one I want to print if it wasn't both. 
And if you're wondering, I did that on this line right here and it turned into that when I just had one variable. Yeah, yeah. If you don't specify with the comma and you just say like for X in student items, then it'll print that full key value pair like you see highlighted there. All right, thanks. Thanks for the answer. Yeah, great question. Guys, this is awesome. I love your questions way more than my slides. Any other questions? Well, sweet. Let's go to my slides. <laughs> All right, let me share my screen here. All right. Making decisions in our code. All right, in Python, we use if statements to cause the computer to make decisions. Common operators used in if statements include all of these, okay? So we should be really familiar with these, not just from previous classes, but also like from elementary school, okay? Um, the, these haven't changed at all since for a long time. Uh, so we do use these in Python. They're very commonly used inside of if statements and anything that needs to, that needs to perform Boolean logic, all right? Now, when I say Boolean logic, I mean that the outcome of it will either be true or false, okay? So if I go back to my code over here and let me take all this out and I say, if um, uh, X is less than 20, or I'll say uh, nine is less than 20, okay? Now this is going to produce an outcome that is either true or false, always, okay? Anytime I use a lesser than sign or a greater than sign or a not equal to sign, all of those will either be true, true or false, okay? If I said um, X is not equal to 50, again, either that's true or it's not true. So this is what's called a Boolean expression or condition, okay? Um, and so right here, we use these operators anytime we want to perform Boolean logic, okay? We wanna say, hey, is this true or is it not true? Whether if it's in a try statement or an if statement or, or some type of a loop. Uh, Python also includes two membership operators, in and not in. This is really nice because a lot of languages don't have these, uh, but it's really nice because we speak English. And so it makes it really easy to say for X in some list or some object, or um, it just makes it really easy to kind of sift through different data structures in our code. Additionally, the following logical operators, we have and, or, and not, okay? Um, so these are awesome, again, because we speak English and it makes it really easy to be like, hey, if this and something else, a lot of other languages, they'll just use different characters on our keyboard to, to mean that. Um, but Python's really nice because I could just say, uh, if X is not equal to 50 and I just write out the word, uh, Y is less than 10, okay? Then I have two Boolean expressions that together form one massive one, all of which will return a true or false. All right, in this case, if this true, if this equates to true, then I have um, this code that executes, otherwise I don't run it, okay. All right, example, what is the output? That stinks, that's down there, that's okay. All right, so go ahead and look at this and let's, let's work through this together, okay? So up top, we declare X, Y, and Z all at five. All right, now let's look at this first statement, okay? Uh, is X less than Y? No, okay, so that's false. Uh, is X modulus two equal to one? Yes, I see a couple nods. What does modulus do again? It just gives you the remainder. Yeah, so five divided by two uh, leaves one left over. Okay, because two evenly goes into four and then there's one left over and that's what modulus gives you. It doesn't give you a decimal like division does. All right, so because one of these is false, all right, the right side's true, but the left side's false. Because we have this and here, this whole statement, this whole Boolean expression with nested Boolean expressions equates to false. All right, we're gonna skip this X plus equals Z. Uh, next one, is X greater than Z? No, is X less than Y? No, okay, so we skip this one. Uh, is Y greater than or equal to Z? Yeah, they're equal. Okay, so X times equals Z. All right, what does this times equal do? Uh, that not that the same as saying X equals X times Z? 
Yeah, it's just a shortcut. So I could say X equals X times Z, uh, which is the exact same as saying X times, oops, X times equals Z. You do the exact same thing. So the multiplication takes place, but then it takes that resulting value and assigns it back to, uh, in this case, X. Okay, great job. All right, so uh, what is X times equals Z? What is X left with? Twenty-five. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. Twenty-five. We're, it's basically just saying uh, x equals x times z, and x times z, five times five is twenty-five. All right, because this was true, this elif, we're just going to skip this else, and we'll skip, or and we'll print x, which is twenty-five. Okay. This shouldn't be a revelation; it should be a review. But any questions on this, you guys? Sweet. Well, let's keep going. All right. Repeating commands and traversing data. It is helpful to be able to repeat a specific group of commands in a program to search through large amounts of, large amounts of data in many applications. As, a, as an example, if a faculty member asks you to enter your I number and you enter an invalid number, it'd be helpful if the computer displayed a message prompting you to enter a valid one and continue to do so until you insert a valid number. If we think about how many programs do this exact same thing, uh, we would have a never ending list. Okay, pretty much every website we ever visit, every program we ever run has loops, repetitious code all throughout for error checking, make sure to make sure that we're inserting the right data. If we type in the wrong password, the program just doesn't die. It says, hey, that was the wrong password. Go ahead and try again. That That's a loop right there. Okay, we see loops all day, every day. Every time we touch an electronic device, we see loops. Uh, we can cause a computer to repeat a group of statements by writing for and while loops. We can also use loops to search through large groups of data to find information. Uh, types of loops. Okay, so we have a for loop. Now, there's lots of different ways that you can use a for loop. All right. Right here, we're using our in operator, which will do something pretty cool for us. All right. This range function, and again, I know that this is a function because of the parentheses right up against the word. Anytime I have a word in Python, with an opening parenthesis right next to it, it's a function, all right? So print right here is also a function. But this range function, what it does is it finds that range, in this case, from zero to 10. And um, every time that we go through that, it'll just return um, the next value in that range, which is pretty awesome. So right here, it says for i in range, uh, zero to 10, and we'll go ahead and print i. Now, let's go ahead and look at this and see what this outputs. Okay, so, um, okay, x equals 10, uh, 4, and we have i in range, 0 to x, and we'll print i. Okay, uh, what would happen right here if I printed x? You just print 10. Yeah, a bunch of times. Sweet. Uh, and what will happen when I print I? What What do you guys think we're going to see in the console when, when we run this? Would that be an endless loop? Ooh, will it make an endless loop? What do you guys think? Yeah, see, nod, see a couple yeah. shakes. Okay. Anyone want to print one? Zero, zero to nine? Yeah, zero to nine. Zero to nine? All right, let's run it. Let's see what happens. So let's see, up arrow, temp two up high. Oh, forgot to save it. My bad. <laughs> okay, look at that, zero to nine. Okay, so very similar to if I had said, you know, I equals zero while I is less than 10, print I. Okay, it'll do the exact same thing, except this is a lot easier. It is automatically incrementing our I for us. We don't have to say I plus equals one or anything like that. Um, and it'll go ahead and do that. Uh, let's look at this one. Here's a while loop example. X equals 10, I equals zero, while I is less than X, print I, and then I plus equals two. Uh, if we were to type that up, what do you guys think we'd see? Two, two, four, eight, six. Yeah, let's see what happens. We'll print I again, 
and then we'll say i plus equals two. I'm going to comment that out. We don't need that right now. Okay, look at that. Zero, two, four, six, eight. Again, we start at zero. We'll always start at zero. In this case, we had to say that we wanted to start at zero. I guess we did here too. Um, but we do have a little bit of flexibility here that we didn't with the range function. Okay, if I wanted to get every multiple of 17 up to 1,000, that would be really easy right here. I'd say zero and 1,000 and x plus equals 17. That's all it takes. And then I run it and there's all my multiples of 17. So if we had used uh, x equals nine, would it still go all the way to eight? So if x, yes. Yeah, so let me undo what I just did. Okay, we have zero to 10 and, or zero to nine, sorry. Okay, and then let's run this and let's see what happens. Okay, we still go zero, two, four, six, eight. All right, but if I change this to eight, whoops, let me, let me save that. Okay, notice this time it only goes up to six. Now I could change that functionality. If I said I is less than or equal to X and that was eight, then it would get that inclusive value, that last number. Um, but we'd have to do that or leave it at 10 or something if we wanted to get those values in there. Brother Birch. Yeah, go ahead, Jaden. Um, in the for loop, could you uncomment that? I just, and right after the X, put a comma two. Won't that increment it by two every time throughout the range? Oh, let's try it. That'd be awesome. Okay. This works, it'll print pretty much this exact same thing right here. That's fantastic. I love Python. Okay. Thank you, Jaden. Appreciate it. Okay. Awesome. Any other questions or comments on this, you guys? Sweet. Well, let's keep going. All right. What is the output? Okay. Go ahead and take a second look at this. Once you feel like you have a good idea, feel free to post it in the chat or shout it out. Okay, I see a nine in the chat. Brigham, is that a hand raise or a five? Five. Okay, any other thoughts? Okay. So we see nine, E6, 10, and five. Let's go ahead and let's step through this. So uh, CSE 111 space, there are seven spaces to loop through. Okay, just as a side question, how many function calls are in this little snippet of code? How many function calls are there? Three, I think three. Okay, anyone have another guess? Say four. Yeah, I, th I think four too. I see range, len, is alpha, and print. Okay, so we have four different functions running in here. What does len return? Uh, that len is len. So isn't that the amount of characters in the core string? Yep, whatever we're passing into length, okay, into that len function, whatever's in between the parentheses, it's basically just going to count. Okay, especially with the string, it'll just say what the length is. So in this case, we have seven total spaces to loop through. Uh, the variable that we're adding to is X. If the spot in course is a letter, how many letters do we have? I see a lot of threes. Would, would space be a letter? No, I agree. It's not a number, but it's also not a letter. It's just 
a space. Okay. Uh, if it is a letter, then we'll add two to the variable X. Okay. So we're at zero and we're going to add two three times for CSE, right? So we're up to six. Um, but we're continuing to loop through this several more times. Okay. If the spot in memory is not a letter, so for the other four that aren't letters, then we're going to add one to the variable X, which leaves us 10 with the number that's printed to the screen. Two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten for those last four characters. Okay. Questions on this one, you guys? So what is I is alpha? Is alpha is a function in Python that will check to see if something is a letter or not. If it's an alphabet character, then that will return true. Okay, so right here, I have a value course at index of I. So um, another way that I could do this, let me just come over to VS Code here. Uh, I could also say um, is a letter, make a new variable equals, and then I could say x dot is alpha. Okay, now is alpha is always going to return true or false. Okay, now in the case of just now, uh, it looked more like this. Course at index of i dot is alpha. Because anytime we're going through a loop, all right, if we look at course, it's this string, and we can traverse a string in Python really easily. So let me go ahead and do that. I'm going to say course equals CSE 111 space, put all that in quotes, take off the parentheses. Okay, there's our string course. All right, now I, we were looping through that, but I could say that I is equal to three. All right, now each one of these characters in this string will have an index, a unique index. That's because if you look deep down in the code, technically every character is stored in its own little slot in memory, just all sequentially, they're all right next to each other. And so when we say that we wanna print up a whole string, it's like, oh, okay, this string is 10 characters long. I'll grab these 10, 10 slots in memory. Okay, but if I just say course at index of i, all right, then I'll look for the index of three in here and we'll say zero, one, two, and three. Okay, so course at index of three is the character one. Okay, that is what's stored in that slot in memory. So right here, I can use uh, bracket notation to say course at index of i, which will get me that single character. And then if I just wanted to print this, we can see if that is alpha is going to return true or false. Now, if we know what is alpha does, we know that it returns true or false based on whether or not it is a, a letter in the alphabet, then we'll know that this will print false. Let's go ahead and run it. Okay, and you can see that it was false. All right, real quick, before we do that, I'm also gonna say print course at index of i, just so we can see that. Okay, it printed a one, and then I could test Make sure that that one dot is alpha is returning what I want it to return. Okay, if I did a two here instead, I'm going to run it again. And now we have an E was found at index of two in course. And that returned true when we said, hey, is E part of the alphabet? Yes. So is alpha returned true? That would be the exact same thing as saying E dot is alpha. Okay. Does that help? So is that a bool function? Like yes, is alpha returns a okay. boolean value. Yes, great question. It'll never return anything but true or false. Okay, any other questions, you guys? Have our teams been decided? Um, yes, I haven't made them yet, but yes. Okay, I'll go ahead and put you in your teams today. I have a few classes to teach over the next couple hours but they will be made today because I'm well aware that you guys have your team activity um, later this week to do. So you will have your teams today. So if you have any preferences on who's in your team, uh, send me a message quick in Slack and hopefully I'll see them before I make your teams officially. Uh, do I care about variable name format? Uh, that is not the most important question. The most important question is, do you care about uh, good variable name format? Yes, you should. You definitely should. And yes, I do. If you're really curious about that, yes, I do. Um, I guess it would also be a question to make sure that Ben Ellis does too, because he's the one that's grading your stuff. <laughs> um, but I, 
he and I are on the same page. Okay. Yes, it matters. Um, we want to be descriptive with our names without writing paragraphs for our names. Okay. Uh, I once heard a number thrown out there that you should never have a variable longer than 50 characters. I have never written a character or a variable probably longer than 20. All right. But, but I guess 50 is like the official limit. Um, but technically you could make a variable name as long as you wanted. Um, but the goal is to just make it descriptive. Okay. It, it should be specific enough that when you look at it, you know what it's for. Uh, I look at this right here, I equals two. I have no idea what I is in this context. Okay. Um, oh, where'd my code go? That was weird. Um, anyways, in this context, I have no idea what I is. If it was in a loop, that's totally cool. All right. But as it is right now, I would want to know, be like, hey, I is the letter that the user asked about that they want to know if it's a character or not or an alphabet a letter or not or something you know in which case i might call this like uh user decision or user something you know uh but we want to make our variables uh specific enough that we know what they are without being so long that it's really hard to like look at your program and know what's going on because the variable names are so long uh caleb asked is camel case okay and i will say in python no it is not. I default to camel case, just like I default to parentheses. When you guys saw me write that if statement earlier, I wrote it with parentheses, even though in Python, you don't write if statements with parentheses. Okay. I have certain tendencies that I do. And thanks to my, my text editor, I pick them up real quickly when I do something wrong. Cause I'll try to write an if statement with parentheses in Python and it shows up this big red line. And I'm like, Oh, yep. I forgot. This is Python, you know? And so, uh, but in many other programming languages, the coding standard for those languages is camel case. Python is not one of those languages. Instead, anytime I have a variable that I that will be several words, I will use underscores and all lowercase. So I could say um, student address or something like that. Okay, all underscore, it's specific. I know what it's referencing um, and no camel case. Underscores to separate the words. Okay. Okay, great questions, guys. Any other questions? Sweet. Well, let's keep going. Oh, uh, another question. Does is decimal do the same for numbers? Yes. So is decimal. Okay. Uh, that is also a Boolean function. It'll return true or false. Uh, but instead of checking for a letter, it'll check for a number. And it'll return true. It'll return true if it's a number. Okay. Um, and I think that was it. Okay. Let's head back over here. All right, storage data types. In all programming environments, it is important to learn how to grab data from a location and store it in a place where it can be accessed. In Python, we use dictionaries, tuples, sets, and lists to store data. Each of them store and retrieve data differently. Tuples and lists. Uh, tuples are immutable, meaning after a tuple is created, it cannot be changed. Uh, lists are mutable, meaning that if I wanted to change any aspect of a list, I could after it's been made. We can add an item to a list using insert and append. Okay, now if I wanted to learn how to use insert and append, if I'm a student just looking at these slides, I'm like, that's great, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, I would just go to Google and I'd say Python insert, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, W3Schools pops up here and we could Google append after this. All right, but we can see it's fruits.insert. It says the index of where we want to insert it at and then what we're inserting. Okay, so currently I have apple, banana, and cherry in this list. Apple would be an index of zero, banana at one, and cherry at two. All right, if I run this function, you can see that orange was inserted right into index of one and, and kind of offset banana and cherry. Okay, so just coming to W3Schools real quick. All I did was type in Python insert. W3Schools was the second one to pop up, and I can kind of test this out. I could add several things in here if I wanted to. Um, and, and get a good feel for what that's doing. Uh, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'll say Python append, okay? Uh, I'm gonna find W3Schools right here. I could also search for this really easily inside of W3Schools. There's a search right here. Um, but add an element to the fruits list. Notice we only have one parameter here. Uh, the last time with insert, we had the index to insert something at, and then the value that we wanted to insert. With append, we have no index, it's just, orange. 
okay? And that will just get appended to the end of a list, okay? Now, if you look at this, um, I can click on any one of these. So we have Python lists, tuples, sets, and dictionaries. These are not in alphabetical order. These are all right next to each other for a reason because they are the different data structures inside of Python that you will use for the rest of the semester. So if I want to look at any of the functionality for any one of these, I could click on it and be like, okay, well, what's a list? What does it do? Um, and what kind of functions can I use with lists? Okay, and there's all this stuff in here. It's fantastic. Okay, now obviously there's a lot more. Okay, I saw at least half a dozen functions that, that we could use with list. We just looked at insert and append. If you wanted to look at every function that exists for a list, then you could just say uh, Python list functions or methods. Okay, uh, we have W3 schools. Anytime I want to find a comprehensive, excuse the pun, list, I would go to the docs, the Python docs. Okay, because here you will see everything that there is. Um, and W3 schools is more of like an introductory, like here's most of the common stuff that you can do with a list. Okay. But you can do the same thing. When you have lists here, I could look at tuples, I could look at sets and dictionaries and see what each of them are, what they look like, how they're used, how they're declared, um, and different methods um, that are frequently used with them. Okay. All right, enough with that tangent, let's keep going. Um, we can replace an item in a list and retrieve an item from a list using the index operators. Uh, this bracket notation that we saw earlier. When we, were, when we were using the string, we could also use uh, this bracket notation or these index operators and isolate any character inside of a string. I can do the exact same thing with a list, okay? And isolate a specific item in the list. We can remove an item from a list using delete, pop, and remove functions. We can find an item in a list using index, and we can determine the number of items in a list using the len function. Okay, questions on this, you guys? Okay, all of these, I would recommend going and using, okay? Go practice, go to W3 schools and be like, okay, how does Python uh, list DEL work, del or delete? Okay, how does that work? Look for an example and then try it out. And then just come over, come over into your text editor and start playing with it, okay? What happens if you pop, use pop or remove or delete? or insert or append. Uh, for additional information about lists and tuples, uh, here's a link for you guys. And you guys should have access to these slides. Uh, how to use and define a list. Okay, so classes. Notice that lists are defined with these square brackets. Okay, um, if, we're, if we were working with a different data structure, we would not use those square brackets, we would be using something else. And we'll look at those in a sec. But working with a list, uh, we just, use our square brackets and we have kind of this comma delimited thing going on in here and each value will make up its own spot in the list. All right, uh, so if I say classes.append math 316, where will math 316 end up in our list? At the end. At the end, which index would that be? Uh, three. Very good. Indices are always zero based in Python. So CSC 111 would be zero, CSC 130 would be one, 280 is two, and then 316 would be three. Uh, print classes at index of zero. What's that going to print for us? CSC 101. Yeah, it's as simple as that. Uh, classes insert zero, CS 124. What's this? What's this? What's this line of code going to do? It'll put it at the very beginning. Yeah. So what index will CSC 111 be at now? One. One. Yeah, because CS124 took the zero spot and then CSC111 would be at at, um, at one. Uh, okay, engineers, software, computer, electrical, engineers plus equal classes. What's that going to look like? It would put both of them next to each other in a big list. Yeah. Okay, so let me come over here. The same way that we saw when I had like x equals five and z equals five and x times equals z, okay? That is the exact same thing as saying x equals x times z. 
It's just a shortcut, a really nice shortcut. Okay. Well, I can do the exact same thing with lists. So if I said, um, I'll, I'll just say names equals square bracket, I'll say Fred and James. Okay. And then I have uh, more names equals um, square bracket Jenny and Julia. Okay. Uh, if I use that plus equals right here and I say names plus equals more names, it will basically just add more names right onto names. Okay. It'd be the exact same thing as I said, as if I said names equals names plus more names. Okay. These two lines of code do the exact same thing. Neither of them print anything. Neither of them show anything. Neither of them changes more names. It just adds the value from more names onto names. All right, at this point, if I wanted to, I could say print names and print more names. And then up here, I'm also going to print names. Okay, and let's see what happens. So I'm gonna hit my up arrow and hit enter. You can see names, the first time it prints on line seven is just Fred and James. And then on line eight, we add more names to it. Line nine, we print Fred, James, Jenny, and Julia. And line 10, we see that more names was not changed, even though we added those values onto our, our first list, onto names. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay. It's nice that it's so simple, right? There are some languages, if you try to add a list to another list, what it'll do is it'll end up making like nested lists for you. So at a single index, we'll have an entire list and it's awful. Python's fantastic. All right. How to use and define a tuple. Okay, uh, notice the change here. Okay, what did we use for lists to make a list? What character here? The bracket. Yeah, we used a square bracket. Okay, for tuples, we use our parentheses. Okay, now usually or very frequently when we see parentheses, we think of functions. Okay, look at all these print statements. Every single one of them has parentheses. These are not referencing tuples directly, okay? Uh, anytime a word is right up against parentheses, like you see with all the prints, you have print, and right after the T, the next character is an opening parenthesis. That is a function call. Uh, anytime you just have parentheses out in the open like this with a few values in them, it will always be a tuple, okay? So uh, we declare tuples with these parentheses. Okay, so we have a tuple, we have one called heroes, one called villains. Um, we can assign different values around, set a tuple equal to another one. Tuples can be added upon by another tuple. And we can also access tuple elements using an index. And here's what all those print statements look like. Let me move my mouse. We'll stop moving my mouse. Okay. All right. Uh, we're just about out of time. So let me just run quickly through dictionaries and sets. Sets are mutable. Um, a set is different from a list. A list allows duplicate items to be stored in it, but a set doesn't allow duplicate items. Items in a set are always unique. If I tried to add something that was already in a lit or in a set to a set, I would get an error and it would not be added. We can also store many items in a Python dictionary. Dictionaries are mutable, meaning they can be changed. We saw a dictionary earlier. Let's look at both of these. Um, so food is a dictionary. How do I know? Because of the key value pairs. The main thing right here is this colon. All right, so hamburger is the key. Cheese, lettuce, and tomatoes is the value of that key. Spaghetti is a key. Sauce, garlic, bread, noodles is the value. Okay, so it is a common delimited list in curly braces with colons, which is a big change from, from the two previous ones that we looked at, okay? Um, lots of things that you can do with dictionaries. You can display the whole thing to the console. We saw that earlier today too. We can look up information in dictionaries. Uh, a new key with values can be added to the dictionary, all right? Uh, the values associated with the key can be edited. Use the delete keyword and key name to delete key value pair. Uh, print food at index of one will throw an error can only look up item by key, not by index. Okay, so effectively the key for dictionaries func or functions as the index, the index that we're used to with other ones. Okay, that's how we uniquely identify something inside of a dictionary is with the key. Okay. All right, you guys, we are about out of time. 
I have loved all your questions. Um, any last words before we part for the day? Brother Birch, is there like, uh, besides doing the practices and the homework, do we, is there like anything that we can do to, you know, keep these fresh or refresh our minds? Because a lot of these I, I remember, but I need to, you know, practice them. Yeah. So I look at this. Um, if, if I learn something once, um, then it'll take more effort to recall it in a year. If mm -hmm. I learn something 100 times, then recalling it in a year will be very easy. And so Python is the same as many other things. Um, the, the more you practice it, that's the more you're, you're essentially learning and reinforcing that learning. Um, and, and eventually you won't even have to think and you'll just do it. Um, but there, there isn't really an easy way to get there. It, it just takes practice or work, however you want to look at it. Um, but I, I love having VS Code open with all of my different projects right here. You can see my CSE 111 programs are organized by week. I can look at anything. You know, if I, if I wanted to look at try accept blocks because I haven't looked at them for a while, I could look at one of these weeks and be like, okay. Or I could even search in this folder and say, hey, um, where can I find an accept? And um, could pull up all the places in code inside that folder where I've used that. And so having my practice essentially, or my knowledge readily accessible really helps me, you know, when I'm switching between languages and projects and classes and, and all this stuff, um, just having everything right here, easily locatable really helps me. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. All right, you guys, um, we do not have class on Wednesday. You're meeting with your teams and I will have your teams made by the end of today. Okay. So you all have an awesome week. Don't be strangers. Reach out if I can help you with anything. Are you going to email the teams to us or Slack? I am just going to add you into private channels on Slack. And I'll go ahead and post something on the announcements channel on Slack to say what all the teams are. So thanks, Beth. Thank you. Thank you guys. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. You have a minute to talk. I sure approach? do. That's why I'm here. What's up? Oh, I think you're on oh, mute. There, there you we go. go. On mute. I was confused about when I was reading the assignments. I thought we didn't have class last Wednesday because it said we were only going to have class on Monday.